and you'll be happy to know that Die Hard, Lethal Weapon, and Robocop are all three of the movies I talk about. This episode is brought to you by Bulletproof Script Coverage, where screenwriters go to get their scripts read by top Hollywood professionals. Learn more at CoverMyScreenplay.com. I'd like to welcome to the show Michael Lucker, man. Thank you so much for being on the show, brother. Sure thing. Thank you for having me. So before we get into how to write an insane action movie, uh, mm-hmm. let's um, let's see how you, how did you get into the business in the first place? Uh, I started writing uh, songs for girls I had crushes on in seventh grade that wouldn't give me the time of day. And then I graduated to writing for the school paper, and then I wrote a play in high school, and then I went off to college and studied writing in Boston, and uh, people thought I was half decent at it, so I moved out to L.A. to uh, you know, try my hand at you know, making my way in the wild world. And um, I landed a gig or two, and I was unhappy with those, so I started typing, and that made me happy, and I... Uh, Ended up getting one script in front of some agents, and they got it in front of some buyers, and I got an option, and then I got hired, and then I got a sell, and then I became a screenwriter. Yeah, uh, uh, and actually a, a paid screenwriter, which is a rarity, uh, <laughs> like a functioning paid screenwriter in the industry. Um, which is funny, you said they used to write songs. I, uh, I too, uh, dabbled in in songwriting for a. The hearts of young ladies back when right. I was uh, when I was we younger, can to try and like you know earn uh, their favor. Unfortunately, I also sung them, and nobody will ever hear those. Uh- <laughs> Yeah, I wasn't much of a singer either. That's why I migrated over to screenplay. Yeah, that's not uh, that's not something that anyone will ever see because it's in my closet, uh, literally. Uh, but so your first movie, if I'm not mistaken, was Vampire in Brooklyn, right? Or is that the first one that you uh, sold? That was the first one. It wasn't the first one that got sold or got hired to write, but it was the first one that got made, I believe. Okay. Yeah, yeah. How many how many scripts did you get optioned or hired to do before that first one? Probably five. We've got a couple things going at Disney. Excuse me, a couple things going at Paramount and Universal. And I think another thing or two. And then we got um, uh, this call on this one, and it just kind of like took off. So. Yeah, and if for people who not don't remember that Vampire in Brooklyn starred Eddie Murphy in, and he was still Eddie Murphy. He's always Eddie Murphy in my, I mean, in my world. He's always Eddie Murphy, but he was at some of the heights of his power back then because he made basically a, a vampire film. Because he wanted to. Yeah. He could do whatever he wanted. I mean, he was one of my heroes growing up. You oh, know, of course. I, I, mean, I mean, 48 Hours in Beverly Hills Cop oh. was like religion to me. And so to, for me to have a chance as a young man, as a young screenwriter, to write a movie for one of my you know, all-time faves was just like a dream come true. I mean, Coming to America is still arguably the greatest comedy of all time. <laughs> I would argue against that, but I... Um, <laughs> it's one of them, at least. You're welcome to your opinion, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, so, uh, so you wrote a book called Crash Boom. What's the title of it? Crash Boom. Crash Boom Bang: How to Write Action Movies. Exactly. Now, how 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 do you write action movies? Because uh, you know, because wh- action movies are in today's world, action movies are pretty much prevalent in all of Hollywood studio system. I mean, they're basically action superhero action or Fast and Furious action. They're all they're all they're all um IP based or franchise based. So having a skill set as at writing a good action movie um, is a good skill set to have in the studio system and also outside the studio system because action movies travel fairly well uh, internationally as well. So I know it's a very broad question. So what are some tips on on how to write a good, and what makes, let's, let's do this, what makes a good action movie? And then we can have a discussion about some good action movies. Right, um, well I think, you know, those two questions go hand in hand and um, what makes a good action movie and how you write a good action movie is, is based on the same tenets that, that make good stories no matter the genre. And it's one of the things that's often lost in a lot of the shallower, you know, vapid, you know, action films that don't have um, much uh, depth to the characters and to their journeys. And so when we're writing good stories of any ilk, you go back to the hero's journey and the principles that have been taught since Aristotle and seeing that range of change from the hero, you know, fixing flaws that they had at the beginning and going through, um, by going through the adversity that they face along the story and see, you know, how they transform and become, you know, stronger, wiser, more courageous, more, 
a little more soulful at the end. What happens, I think, in a lot of action movies is those basic principles are lost. Mm -hmm. Or they try to spread it so thin, especially in sort of films that have um, too many primary um, you know, characters up top. They're trying to develop everybody. You don't get to get into anybody in much detail. And so we as the audience may not connect with them um, as deeply um, or as honestly as, as we could because the studios are trying to give a little something of everybody to everybody in the audience. So, you know, when people say, how do you write a great action movie? And I'm like, learn how to write a great movie. Learn how to write a great story. So there's you and I see you and I are from the same vintage, if you will, uh, age wise. Yeah. So we kind of grew up watching. Uh, it sounds like we, we both grew up watching a lot of the same great action movies of the day. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I personally think that the 80s and 90s, but the 80s had a just a, is a golden age for action movies, you know, because 70s. I mean, you know, we got Smokey and the Bandit and that kind of stuff, but they didn't come into it really into their own heavily uh, into the eighties. So I want to talk about three movies and I want to hear what you think about them. I think they're three of their, their top five in my world. Uh, yeah. Die yeah. hard, die hard, obviously. Absolutely. Lethal one weapon, my, lethal weapon. First one. One of my faves. And predator. The first predator. Really? Predator is your third. It's that, well, not like in order. I'm just saying that there's other action movies that I enjoy too. I mean, obviously Commando. No, I'm joking. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I mean, I do love it for my I – can't, if I watch that movie today, I'm sure I'm going to go, oh, this is horrible. But in my mind, it's still pretty awesome. <laughs> really? okay. uh, but I could watch Die Hard. I watch it every year as a Christmas movie because yeah. I did a whole episode on how it's the greatest Christmas movie of all time. Um, then there's Lethal Weapon, which I could still watch today and it holds. And you can watch Predator and – it still holds, and at least for me. And I was wondering what you think about well, like Die Hard. We've talked about a nauseum, and we all know that's you know the his the hero's journey, the everyman. I mean, what do you think? Just really quickly, let's go over Die Hard real quick and what makes it such sure. an amazing action movie. Well, I'll say this: you're speaking my language, really, um, because and if it puts anything in perspective for you, when I was a young man out of film school coming from the East Coast, and I landed in North Hollywood, and I got my first job in my little hole-in-the-wall apartment I had in it, um, you know, <clears throat> off Magnolia. I um, uh, had two posters framed on my bedroom wall, and they were lethal weapons. Lethal weapon. weapon and, <laughs> and it was largely because that was just part of, you know, the lexicon of the time that kind of helped shape me as a young storyteller and filmmaker. Mm -hmm. And you got great writers like, you know, Jeff Stewart and Steven DeSouza and Shane Black, of course, who remains one of my favorites. Um, they did things at the time that revolutionary, revolution, revo revolutionized. Yeah, revolutionized. Thank you, writer. Um, <laughs> the way storytelling was done. <clears throat> and yeah. they brought heart and soul and pain and um, flaws to the heroes in a way that a lot of traditional action movies had not done as much of prior. And so we really identified, connected with, and, and cheered for those, for, you know, um, John McClane and Martin Riggs in ways that we had not done for heroes um, before that. So those movies, I mean, to me, are quintessential. And I encourage all uh, writers who are interested in doing action movies to not only see those movies and study those movies, but read the scripts and look at how those writers crafted those images and created that tension and scenes and created that sort of identification, you know, for the uh, audience and, you know, the reader to have with those heroes. Yeah, Shane, Shane is, Shane Black is you know, arguably one of the greater, he's, he's, he's in the top lexicon of, uh, of screenwriters in general, but what he did in some of those early scripts, you, le you read the original Last Boy Scout, not mm -hmm. what was made, but the original Last Boy Scout, sure. Long yeah. Kiss Goodnight, yeah. uh, Lethal Weapon. Uh, I think he, he didn't do Lethal Weapon 2. I think he did just a story of Lethal Weapon 2. But I think Jeffrey Bone did. Lethal yeah, uh, mm -hmm. but that was still also a great a great film as well. Lethal Weapon, um, uh, he didn't write – no, he wrote the new Predators. He didn't write the old Predator. But um, but just wa just wa watching his descriptions – yeah, I mean, his 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 vocabulary was so, and he breaks rules. He breaks rules left and right. You know the way he writes the description, how he does it. 
it's just like when Tarantino, you know, when he writes his dialogue, he just breaks he breaks rules all the time. But they're masters. They're absolute masters. And then you have to you have to read those scripts. Yeah, you really do because like seeing the movies is one thing. They're working on screen, but you know, given, you know, the quantity of scripts that consume the studios every year, the scripts that rise to the top really have to stand on their own in order to stand out. And that means the words they use, you know, the um, images that they convey as concisely and as creatively as they do, puts you in that moment, puts you in that place, and you really feel like you are, you know, in that car chase or, you know, scaling down that mountain or being thrown out that window. No question. And, like, when I watched Lethal Weapon, because that was during my – video store days when I worked at a video store. Um, I, I, I must have watched Lethal Weapon like 20, 30 times. It was just such a, the character of Riggs, his transformation to the end, it's, you just didn't see that. That was just something that wasn't done in action movies. It, it was so revolutionary. And I mean, Die Hard took that to a, another place because, as well, both of them in their own way. But you're right. It was just, you felt for the, so before you would have like, you would have Schwarzenegger show up and right. you know Schwarzenegger and Stallone they would just be these hyper real gods basically that could do no wrong and they could you know shoot guns until the, the, the cows come home and they never get hurt oh I got dinged and I just keep going don't have time to bleed and, and all right. that kind of stuff uh, but then you got something like Die Hard where John McClane's character is he's a normal dude going through normal stuff and he doesn't look like an Adonis and you got right. Martin Riggs who also doesn't look like an Adonis, and he is a very fractured character as a human yeah. being. He's on literally on these on the edge. Uh, go ahead. Well, one of the things that, that uh, I think Shane Black did, and and they do in Die Hard as well, is the transformation of the hero is represented in such a clear and subtle and powerful way. Um, that whether we're conscious of that as an audience member or unconscious of it, we feel it. And so, for example, in Lethal Weapon, you might remember when we meet Martin Riggs, he's got the special silver bullet loaded in his gun and he's got it in his mouth and he's oh. ready to take his own life over the grief he feels over the loss of his wife, right? So that's the opening shot of our hero. And for us to see that in the 80s, it's like this is our hero, a guy who's like living – you know, in a trailer alone on the beach with a gun in his mouth. What happens through the course of the movie is he grows and rebuilds his self-esteem and, re and finds a new sense of purpose as through his job and through saving Murtaugh and his family and ultimately others. And by the end of the movie, and this is what makes like Shane Black's writing so powerful, the last scene of the movie if you remember, is Riggs walking up to Murtaugh's house yeah. and giving him that same silver bullet that he was going to use to take his own life as a Christmas present when he came for Christmas dinner. Mm -hmm. And he goes, he goes um, it's a bullet. And Riggs' last line of the movie is, yeah, I don't need it anymore. Oh, it's just, it's just so good. So and the those music. Little, those little things, uh, you know, that we try and teach and talk about in, a, in, in you know, an academic you know, um, setting or, you know, in a lecture or seminars is the kind of stuff that really makes, I think, movies um, resonate with audiences on, um, you know, a wide scale. And I think another movie that it's not often thrown in that list, but should be, in my opinion, is the original RoboCop. I completely agree. It, 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 it's yeah. such a good movie. And at the, in the, in the uh, on the surface... It's just a good action movie. But if yeah. you go back in the layers of onions and what Verhoeven and the writer are trying to, to talk about in that film. Oh, it's so good. I think Michael Miner was the writer of that one. Yeah. And, you'll, and you'll be happy to know that Die Hard, Lethal Weapon, and Robocop are all three of the movies I talk about in my book. <laughs> as you should, sir. As, as you should. Thank you. As, yeah. you, as you should, sir. Yeah. So, all right. So with every good hero, there has to be a good villain. And in so many action movies, the villains are horrible. Um, right. They're just bad. They're one-dimensional. They're paper. They're twisting the, the 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 mustache kind of heroes. But in but in 
let's just analyze those three movies, Robocop, Lethal Weapon, and Die Hard. The villains are almost as memorable, if not more memorable sometimes, than the hero itself or on par. So with Die Hard, Hans, everyone, I mean, you can't think of McLean without thinking of Hans. Sure. You can't think of Mr. Joshua, the, the great Gary Busey, right. when he was great. Um, yeah. When he was great. Um, and then in RoboCop, the um, the corporate the corporate CEO, you yeah. know, they were just so evil. <laughs> well, we often say in screenwriting, right, that um, that uh, the hero can only be as powerful and strong, and their their um, uh, victory can only be as rewarding as the opponent's um, uh, merit. So if you have an unformidable um, villain. Then it's not going to mean much for you know Luke Skywalker to take you know out you know some you know nebbishy little dude with his lightsaber. But when Darth Vader is the formidable bad guy, then there's something to happen there. So you need in good stories, right? Whether it's a love story, a drama, or a comedy, you need a formidable opponent in order for the audience to invest in and feel victory when the hero defeats them, right? South. So that's one thing about uh, being powerful opponents. Um, the other thing to consider is that just as good heroes have strengths and weaknesses and have their um, skills and also have their, their flaws, um, so too should good opponents. And that's one of the things that happens in all those movies is they're not the twirly, you know, mustache, you know, black hat wearing, you know, one note villains. They might be doing... Um, horrible things, but they have their own justification for doing them. Or sometimes they started on a path that led to things beyond uh, a way that they ever expected. So the, the trick is to find a balance between that formidability, right, and also that human aspect. And even in something like Predator, it's what makes that movie <sighs> resonate with audience because when Schwarzenegger finally has the Predator down, you know, and he has them, you see the humanity really in the monster. And, and that's the moment where your hero Schwarzenegger has to make the moral choice of whether he's going to put a spike through the guy's face, you know, or, or not. If, are we going to rise above, you know, the lowness that uh, the aliens had? So uh, there's two movies that come to mind because I think you're right. I absolutely think you're right in regards to having a great, you have to have a great villain to have, a good hero without one or the other it doesn't work it's the yin and the yang but then there's movies like uh blood sport which again in my mind fantastic uh i if i watch it today we'll probably tear it apart but if i remember correctly the villain wasn't particularly a deep villain but he was physically um a, a, a threat and that's why that fight at the end and the whole journey is weak as the story might have been in that movie. Um, yeah. That's why, you know, you, he was just such a, a massive man and they built him up so much that it made it made that fight at the end or the whole journey up into that fight work to a certain extent. Again, I know Bloodsport shouldn't even be in the same conversation as the movies we've been talking about. But just I, I just want the audience to understand the physicality now. Physicality does count for something like Dark Vader is like six seven, uh, so he's also a very large, large man. But then you look at a movie like Commando, which again, which is not a great film, and I think one of the reasons it's not, there's many reasons why it's not great. It is great in my mind, but not great in, in the traditional minds. Is the villain? He looked like a pipsqueak next to Arnold. Do you remember? Like he, I, I even as a kid, I'm like. That's not a challenge for Arnold. Like Arnold could take that guy in a fight, but when you get to Predator, <laughs> that's a whole other conversation. And and the Predator is not a deep character. He's a very one-dimensional character who does not change throughout the entire process of the film. But his abilities are what are formidable to an entire elite crew that make that movie work. I would love to just, you know, hear your thoughts on it. Sure. Um, well, I think that those movies that you mentioned, the blood sport and the commando and the predator, um, they don't have sort of the depth and humanity and, and sort of, you know, dexterity of some of the other villains that we talk about in the really good movies. And I think mm -hmm. that's a good sort of juxtaposition to see, you know, in the good movies that 
are remembered, mm -hmm. right? Become iconic. You know, there are great heroes who are saddled, you know, in extraordinary situations against formidable villains with depth. And when you don't have that, then no matter how cool, sexy, smart, and creative your hero is, it doesn't really um, uh, carry as much, uh, much weight. So you're telling me that splits aren't going to make it the story better? <laughs> uh, not that I, I'm aware of. Yeah, I don't I, know how to do it. Yeah. I still, I, I, I still try to do it and it doesn't work. I don't know how John claude does it. <laughs> I mean, he made an entire career off that damn split. I remember that every movie, because I was a huge, I mean, I was a kid. So it was, when he was, those movies were coming out, every movie, they'd work a split in somewhere, like in yeah. the weirdest places. <laughs> but it's I funny. I just, I saw a Mission Impossible 2 was on TV last night yeah. and I was watching a little bit. And I love Mission Impossible and I'm a big Tom Cruise fan. Mm -hmm. But Tom Cruise was doing his quintessential sprint down. <laughs> Did you see those I'm YouTube like, videos that, that he's he, just he, running? <laughs> I think it's in his contract. He must run at least 100 yards at full tilt in every movie. He and does. honestly, that's something that studios have identified, you know, in, in films like, yep. you know, you know, we want to like, like audiences want to see Brad Pitt take his shirt off and audiences want to see, you know, Tom Cruise. Just run. As as he can, you know. <laughs> so I think the sprints and the splits were both contractual probably. Because, you know. <laughs> and Tom is one of those, you know, Tom is, you know, talking about these old action movies. I mean, these were, these were movie stars. You know, these guys were movie stars. And nowadays, there aren't as many movie stars anymore. The movie star power is gone, where before a commando would be made purely on the on the strength of Arnold. A movie like that would never be made without movie star power behind it. Uh, right. Even in today's world, we'll talk about today's world in a second. Well, I, I think, I mean, you're bringing it up. So I think, I think it, it's a combination of the nature of the marketplace, right? Because mm -hmm. of the proliferation of digital media and the fact that Anybody can sit on their couch, you know, in their den and turn on a thousand channels, you know, um, and have, have that at their beck and call and watch whatever they want. It needs to be something special to get them off the couch to come into a dark theater to sit with strangers to pay 15 bucks a pop to get in the door, let alone 10 bucks for, for popcorn. popcorn. So... In order to do that, it needs to be a big spectacle, and big spectacles cost money, and you got to have a big movie star in those spectacles to, to you know, uh, justify the expense. But would you agree, though, that um, that Chris Evans isn't a movie star, but Captain America is? I, I think that's a great example, because I saw Chris Evans in an action movie before he was known yeah, he, he's, not a, he's a good actor, and he's done a bunch of stuff. He's a good actor. And, and he's then, done a bunch of stuff, then, yeah. And then I remember um, this Captain America movie came out, and I was like, who's this guy? <laughs> like, why, who, who's going to go watch this guy do anything? And, um, and I think he's fantastic in the role. Oh. But, mm -hmm. but he, and he's a great actor, but you're right. There is a difference between, between being a great actor and being a movie star. And some of those things are – you know, energetic and soulful and undescribable. You know, some people just have it and and some people as talented as they are just may not. And also and also the other thing is that and I, I think this is important for screenwriters listening, is that a lot of times they think if I could just get like my screenplay to Chris Evans, and I'm not picking on Chris, but but yeah, just if I could get it to Chris Evans or I can get it to Daniel Craig, or if I can get it to, you know, one of those characters uh, one of those actors who play those big roles, either James Bond or Spider-Man or something like that, they don't, ha outside the suit, outside the character, they don't have the markability. They're good. They're huge stars. But you look at Robert Downey, he just came out with Dr. Doolittle and it tanked. And, right. and, Robert, and Robert Downey Jr. is probably one of the most famous actors in the world. He's one of the most talented actors of his generation. Absolutely. Um, he's, I mean, he's amazing. But yet... Doctor, it did not drive sales to Doctor Doolittle. The only thing outside of Marvel that's had any sort of success is the Sherlock Holmes movies, mm -hmm. and that's a one-off. So he hasn't been able to, like, unlike Arnold or Stallone, that he would they would just pump out right. because they were movie stars in an age of movie stars. Where I think the age of movie stars is kind of over for the most part. There are certain, like, The Rock is the closest thing I think we have. Yeah, and even then, 
if he's not in the right movie. You put you put the rock in a drama, it's not gonna work. <laughs> right. Um well it's it's a good point. I think that, you know, times are changing. And it's one thing to remember is that, you know, you said there are no movie stars now or they're not what they once were. And I would just qualify that by saying maybe there's not as many as there were and there's not as many right now. But it doesn't mean the landscape is going to change because even though we're in the wild west with a thousand channels and mm -hmm. you know, all digital platforms, yeah. things continue to evolve. Oh, yeah. And filmmakers and brilliant studio bosses are continually um, trying to uh, ride those waves and oftentimes surprised by, by what they find. So I think, you know, we are in the middle of sort of a renaissance of sorts where things are changing and everybody's trying to figure it out. D nobody knows anything. Every, I mean, no, like everyone's still like trying to. Like William Bowman taught us. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Nobody knows nothing. And, um, uh, but I think, I think that Disney is probably one of the only companies out there who really got it early on. They're like, you know what's going to come? IP. We need to buy as much IP as we can. And that's yeah. what they did. And now they just made what, I think it was 10 billion gross this year at the box office. So they basically were at, out of every, you know, I mean, they just, I don't know, five, six, seven movies that broke a billion dollars. Yeah. They figured something out where I think the rest of the studios are trying to, trying to find like, you know, Harry Potter's gone. They can't, right. unless, they, until they reboot it, you know, Fast and Furious only has how many more of those? <laughs> well, you, you have to credit them um, for having um, the vision, the forethought, you know, Viger and the rest of them. Oh, and yeah. Eisner days. You know, oh, no, he built, he started it. As they all recognize the power of, you know, owning, you know, property that not only would reach audiences going forward in masses, but also had reached audience in mass prior to that. And they were willing to spend a few extra bucks and outbid others in order to hold on to that thing, knowing that they could take a Star Wars and turn out a Mandalorian and a Solo and everything else out of the brand that they own. Because as we all know as writers, if the studios own it, they get to do whatever they want with it. For and better fun. or for worse. <laughs> <laughs> For better or for worse. Now, that brings up a good point. As writers, uh, you know, as, as screenwriters coming up in the world, because I know when you started and when I started, it was a completely different landscape, completely different way of doing business. There was a much less competition, uh, even though it was still a brutal time as far as competition. But now there's, there's a lot more opportunity, but there's a lot more competition. Where do you think a screenwriter should focus on if they're going to write an action movie? If, because I know a lot of screenwriters will write these giant tentpole action movies that are not based on IP, they're originals. And I'm like, dude, you, if you want it as a, as a, as a writing sample, fantastic. But the chances of the studio putting a hundred million dollars or plus in a non IP action movie is going to be difficult unless you're James Cameron and you come up with Avatar and that's a different conversation. But where do you think they should focus? Should they show focus on the lower budget action movies, which there's still a lot of, you know, 15, 20 million and below kind of things that are done for international, the Nicolas Cage movies, the, right. you know, those kind of films that still have a marketplace for them. It's a little bit easier to get into that. I'm just curious where you're, where you stand on that. What do you think? Well, I think you're right that the, um, the expansion of opportunities based on, you know, the, um, you know, the elevation in technology is granted more chances for more writers to do more things. Mm -hmm. At the same time, um, the money may not be as much as it was, but there may be more opportunity. So, you know, all my writer friends I know are writing everything they can, you know, and that means they're writing features and they're writing television and they mm -hmm. might be writing, you know, commercial copy as well because they're writers and they love to write. And it's part of their soul. And that's why people should write is to tell good stories and um, and help, you know, change the world, ideally make it a better place, you know, <laughs> and lift, lift spirits and, you know, um, warm hearts and all those things. And if you get into the writing business for the wrong reasons, because oh. you're trying to make a million dollars or you're trying to prove to your high school principal that you could amount to something one day or, you know, uh, prove to the girlfriend that jaded you in elementary school, then then you're doing it for the wrong reason. It's going to be a long, 
rocky road. So I think you know, the bottom line is write everything you can and do it because, you know, you love it and kind of let the universe sort of support you in that path because it's hard to control things once they leave the computer. Preach, my friend, preach. <laughs> Now, I, I, I've heard many times before from other screenwriting um, gurus or, or people that are in the screenwriting oh. educational space, uh, and also from screenwriters in general, that studios look for a certain amount of action sequences spread out through your so – you, you could literally count them like there's an action sequence, eight minutes later, another action, eight minutes later or ten minutes later. In your experience, what's your school of thought on that? Well, it's interesting. <clears throat> uh, it's a great question. Um, you know, we all kind of understand an inherent three-act structure, right? Um, and Joel Silver, a uh, producer of Lethal Weapon, Die Hard, incidentally, came along with uh, what I believe he termed the, the whammo chart. And it was like something significant needs to happen that surprises the audience every 10 pages. So if you're looking at a two-hour movie or at 120 pages, you're looking at basically... 11 significant surprises along the way. So I think you can kind of extrapolate that in some ways and apply it to content of any length. But at the same time, you got to remember um, that you know, audiences today are different from audiences that you know grew up on Lethal Weapon and Die Hard like you and I did, right? And they're used to not only seeing things much faster, but they're also used to watching three or four screens at the same time. Right. So you almost need to, I think, in some ways, increase the quantity of surprises as long as they're um, germane to the story and organic to character so that you are keeping, you know, the ADD and ADHD, you know, generation um, from changing the channel when they're sitting at home on their couch or from getting up and going for gummy bears at the theater and not coming back. Do you remember the indie movie Run, Lola, Run? I know of it. I don't remember the movie. The movie itself, I remember that it was literally nonstop tension or action the entire – like it was just like – it it didn't stop. And I I found it exhausting. Like so uh, that's dangerous. (laughs) It is dangerous. And I learned that lesson the hard way. I was at a pitch at uh, DreamWorks with Jeffrey Katzenberg and I was pitching to him uh, an action movie. And I I remember saying something along – ridiculous along the lines of – you know, it's going to be nonstop action. It's going to be, you know, one of the, it's going to be a fantastic action movie. And he, he very simply and bluntly, as he's known to do, goes, uh, Michael, you, um, uh, it can't be all action. And I was like, why? It's an action movie. Come on. It'll be great. He's like, no, you have to have those roles, those moments of reflection, those moments of recovery, you know, in order for there to be a little bit of um, – juxtaposition and diversity in terms of the story flow and in terms of the audience's journey. And if you don't have those things, not only a chance for the hero to rest and recover and reflect, but kind of for the audience too, then you're really missing out on the opportunity to surprise them or elevate them, you know, on the roller coaster ride of ups and downs, you know, on the next turn. That's why the roller coaster is not all the way up for a mile and then all the way down for a mile. That's why there's ups and downs because if not, you couldn't handle it. And the same thing goes for like tension. Like if you watch a Hitchcock film, he's such a master at it. He just yeah. he would just play the audience like a, like a fiddle and he'd go up and he'd go down and he'd go up. But if you hold it too long, you hold that note too long, just like in a song, yeah. you're going to lose the audience. The interesting thing about Hitchcock uh, that always really uh, um, impressed me was how he, not only would he manage tension, but he would manage the audience's allegiance with characters. Oh, we'll yeah. cheering for the hero for eight minutes, and then we'll go through a door, and we'll be on the other side of the door with the villain stuck in a situation, and we'll be rooting for the villain, waiting for him to, you know, I worried about him getting caught by the cops that we were just cheering for a minute ago. And he would take our uh, emotions and flip them back and forth like nobody I've ever seen since, really. Yeah, I mean, and, and let's not even get into Psycho. I mean, killing off. I mean, sorry, spoiler alert, everyone. Killing off the, the main movie star in, in the first act. Just like, what? Who? That, can you imagine in 1960 doing that? Like, it's, it's an old, old move, yeah. It was insane. Yeah. I think it's one of the things that made Game of Thrones so successful until the end was that. Um, <laughs> you know, until that the end. <laughs> we, never knew, we never knew whose head was going to get chopped off. 
right? Or, or what other body part might get chopped off? You know, we were always surprised, um, and they kept us. You know, Benny and Weiss kept us on the edge of our seats. You know, every every night we tuned in. Did you are you a fan of Walking Dead? Um, no, is the quick answer to it. So, uh, you know, I live um, in Atlanta now, right? And so it is a part of you know the Atlanta culture, and mm-hmm. certainly with the proliferation of film production in Georgia now, um, Walking Dead and Vampire Diaries are two of these series in recent years that help stand as a healthy foundation to build much of this, um, you know, production infrastructure. Uh, so it's big worldwide. I think it's recognized as being one of the, if not the most successful television show um, in, in, in history, right? Um, broadcast or otherwise. Um, and I was just never a big fan of zombies. And people would come so to me and go, it's all about the characters. It is. And I, just, and I, I get it, and I've seen a few episodes, but it just was never my jam. And when guys would come... You know, lurching out of the shadows, you know, with their faces peeling off and their eyes falling out, you know, with the same goal of eating our hero. I, um, it just didn't grab it. It didn't grab me, you know, um, whether it grabs many other people. It just goes to show you can't please all the people all the time. You have to, um, tell the story the best you can for, you know, the market you hope to achieve. Yeah, I mean, I, I was a fan of that show for probably about five or six seasons, but then there was a major, there was a main character, that a villain that came in, and they, he just kept beating our, the characters I've loved so much that you ne- there was no break. So the, the villain, mm-hmm. Deegan, would just, he, he was just, it was just like a punch, punch. Normally when you have a villain that's like that powerful, you got to get a couple licks in. But they, yeah. he, they just kept beating him to the point where I just got tired of watching my characters that I'd fallen in love with get beaten so much. I'm like, I'm out. I can't. I just can't deal with this anymore. And it turned me off personally. And, it, and the ratings did eventually go down. I think they had been going down a little bit. They're still super popular. Um, mm. But that was that was a mistake that I saw. I was like, I, I can never do that with a character of mine where if you have a imagine if Darth Vader never he just kept pounding on Luke to the point where Luke just could never get up. What's yeah. the point? What's the point? Yeah, we, you're right. We don't want to see that. We're investing in those characters. And if it makes you feel any better, I, um, you know, I'm teaching screenwriting at a university here. Mm-hmm. And I often take a temperature read on, on what's happening in culture and the zeitgeist based on my 19, 20, 21-year-old you know, students in the program. And I had them watch Walking Dead a couple of weeks ago talking about how you know, film production and television production is – you know, increased in the state. And I asked them why they lost interest. And they said the exact same thing. Really? Characters. Because somebody identified with this character or identified with that character. And in general, the answer was because they kept killing off the people that we love. So if you're doing that, and to Game of Thrones credit, what they did do was if they killed off somebody... They were bringing in somebody new, bringing somebody new, bringing somebody new. And so that there was constantly um, rebirth while there was death. Yeah. And that, that was one of the big problems. I like I, 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 with Walking Dead in general, it's like they would kill off. I mean, that was kind of the exciting thing. Like you never knew who there was no one safe, really, except right. for maybe a couple of top guys that you knew they're not going to kill off. And you'd be like, no, is this the week? No, don't, don't, ah, oh, why'd you get rid of them? And that's always a rough, it's a rough situ- situation. And even though they brought new guys in, but then they would kill them off. It was just like, emotionally, it's it's a bit much. <laughs> I wonder if in the old days, before social media allowed everybody to vent and talk about everything that was happening, if that was a more insular experience and um, and also a more secretive experience, now, if somebody dies in an episode, everybody's going to know about it within 90 seconds of it happening because it's all over social media. And so for those who haven't seen it yet, it's ruining the surprise that the filmmakers or show creators have worked so hard to create oftentimes over many episodes or even many seasons. Yeah. And it's it's a diff, it's it's look it's storytelling in general from the times when, when we were coming up to the now the audience is so much more savvy, so much yeah. more educated. 
they understand terminology like plot points, like the hero's journey, like you know yeah. the, the point of no return. These are things that a lot of audience members, even if they might not know the articulation of it, they mm -hmm. can recognize it um, because they've been like, there's generations who've just been raised. Like I was a TV guy. I'm sure you were. You know, we watch TVs and movies constantly growing up. VH VHSs came up, and that was the first time we could just watch anything and everything all the time. But yeah. now take that and put it on steroids and and now it's everything's instant ever made <laughs> it's well, what available it allows us to do now as storytellers and what i encourage my um students to do is to take the sort of paradigms that we're used to that they're used to and manipulate it in fresh new ways and i think it's one of the reasons you know christopher nolan's work oh. has met such popularity is because He's twisting and turning at such a rate and surprising us in such a way nowadays that even those who do know about plot points mm -hmm. and, finance and character arcs are seeing those things turned on their ear. And that is refreshing and that is exciting. Same thing with Tarantino's work. Uh, you know, yeah. you, you, there's there's certain, but the guys you're talking, just putting those two in the same sense is like they're, they're absolute masters. Um, right. Of the but craft. I would say this, and this is part of what I preach too, is they're masters because they understand the foundations of the genre and foundations Correct. of the medium first and foremost. Mm -hmm. They know those things better than anybody, which allows them the, 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 the healthy footing to take it and mix it all up and do it in a whole new way. Yeah, it's, it, but you need, you're right. It's kind of like being a master baker. And you know every element of the ingredients and what those ingredients can do. And now I'm going to I'm gonna do something that you've never seen before. But I understand if you need me to make a chocolate cake, I'll make you a chocolate cake that's going to blow your mind. Right. But my chocolate cake now is going to explode and you're going to love it. And have avocado in it. And <laughs> right. In the rock world, yeah. And you're just like, avocado and chocolate cake? What? And then you yeah. taste it like, how have I not thought of this before? And that's like watching a Tarantino or Nolan movie at this point. Yeah, sure. um, and now one thing you talk about in your book, uh, sneaky transitions. Can you, okay. can you elaborate about that a little bit? Um, sure. So speaking of old action movies, do you remember Highlander? Well, of course. It should be the only one, right? It should be. It Actually, I wouldn't mind a reboot of that. I would love to see like a, that would be a good one. Yeah. That would be a good reboot. Yeah. So one of the things that I loved about that movie um, yes. is that the transitions um, were so clever and subtle, taking us not only from one scene to the next, right. but oftentimes from one time period to another time period. And it made the storytelling cre uh, creative and effortless. And, and those transitions were part of the story. So it wasn't like a jarring departure, a jarring transition. When, when those transitions can be part of the story and help push story forward or help reveal character some way or help um, elevate you know, the overall theme of the story, that's when I think movies are working on all cylinders. Because not only is character right and stories right and actions right, but also going from one scene to the next just keeps us – um, on an even keel moving without stopping to realize that we're actually in a movie. And that's something that drives me crazy in, in, in movies, um, is that when we get pushed and pulled out of the film, um, it, um, it removes us from sort of the emotional connection we have with the hero. My students love Deadpool, and I can appreciate the masterful oh. filmmaking, and the incredibly brilliant acting and the wittiful, you know, dialogue. I admire all that. But I'm constantly being pulled out of that story because of its meta-ness. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me I'm watching a story. And so I, and partially because I grew up on, you know, right. older films. So I don't want people to keep jumping in and reminding me that, you know, we're watching a movie. I want to be lost in it and feeling it, you know. And I think smooth transitions allow us to do that and of course the soundtrack of queen i mean that also helped that movie <laughs> and Rhapsody, just a little bit. <laughs> that was so amazing that's such a it's such a great film um now i'm going to ask you a few questions i ask all of my guests uh okay. what advice would you give a screenwriter wanting to break into the business today um 
Well, we've already been hitting this a little bit, but learn the craft. I mean, a lot of people have great ideas and they crank them out on cocktail napkins or paper towels, right? Um, but taking them from great ideas to um, great screenplays takes an understanding, you know, of the way movies are woven and the way stories are told. And so whether it's taking seminars, taking workshops, taking classes, reading scripts, watching movies, all those things are going to help um, educate you in a way for you to develop your own style. I think a lot of students, you know, um, and, you know, workshop attendees um, – or potential students and you know attendees have reservations thinking that understanding the way what they term formula or template or structure is going to impede their creative process. And I say it does not. It helps you. Um, so I think that is the first thing. Um, and also knowing that like if you write a great script, I think, and you get it in the hands of people that recognize great scripts – the universe is going to conspire to support you, mm -hmm. right? So it's like you don't have to figure out, you know, everything. But the hardest thing to figure out is how to write great screenplays. And I've had a number of students over the years in workshops or otherwise that when they wrote great scripts, they consistently would win a screen craft festival and Slam Dance, and Nashville, and Austin, and Atlanta, because those independent festival panels of judges that were looking at great screenplays, that were looking at 800 here, 1,200 there, 2,000 there, all recognized that great writing. So really the key is write a great script and then get it into the hands of people that recognize great scripts. Excellent advice, sir. Um, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film industry or in life? Uh, the answer to both is the same, and it's uh, listen better. <laughs> yes. You know, um, <laughs> I think, you know, oftentimes, you know, we writers are communicators and we are expressive and we are, when given the opportunity or not given the opportunity, we want to impose our opinions, our values, our beliefs, our thoughts. And, you know, I'm just a teacher in me that wants to help teach, right? So you're constantly expressing. But the problem is, if you're constantly, you know, gabbing, then there's no room for you to really learn. And I think it's great, you know, Zen teaching that something along the lines of, you know, um, you know, the, this, the speak, the, the wise um, are, are silent, basically, and those who are unwise are, are the talkers. So I think the more you can listen to feedback you're given from those you're working with in a creative setting um, and those in your uh, personal lives as well, I think it um, will help make you a, a better writer and a better person. What is the biggest fear you had to overcome when you was writing your first script? Wow. The biggest fear. Oh, I, well, I remember it probably wasn't the first script. It was the second script. But I was so caught up in trying to, do to double cross and triple cross and quadruple cross the audience to make it the coolest, clever, turny, right. clever yeah. film that I could that I got so lost in it that I couldn't find my way out of it. And it's because I didn't have a foundational understanding at the time. I learned a lot doing it, but because I was so caught up in the maelstrom and the storm of all those double crosses, I literally couldn't you know, find a clear road to finishing and it took me a long time. Like, you know, contractually now as writers with the WGA, if we're hired to write an original screenplay, we get 12 weeks and we have to deliver in 12 weeks. You don't get six months or eight months or two years, you know? And so, um, and that can happen if you don't have a clear roadmap. And that's where a clear understanding of storytelling and structure helps because you don't get lost. You don't get stuck. You don't get blocked. And uh, three of your favorite films of all time. Wow, we talked about two of them, probably. Okay, so Die Hard and Le Lethal? Puppet and Die Hard are definitely up there on all time, uh, you know. And I got to say, the one movie that 
was the movie that led me to realize as a young punk that I wanted to become a filmmaker was Raiders of the Lost Ark. Ah, oh, so good. So when I was a young man in Atlanta, Georgia, in Atlanta, Georgia, I stumbled out of the theater, and I remember looking up at the stars after the movie thinking, that's what I want to do with my life. And when I was 21, and I landed in Los Angeles as a young man, you know, my first you know, year out of film school, um, the job I landed was working for Steven Spielberg on um, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. So oh my, God. my life became full circle um, in a way that, in, in a way that you know, few people um, have the good fortune of. Well, uh, we'll have to do another episode on the Last Crusade Adventures because I'd love to know how that was <laughs> being on that set was like. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, where can people find you and your book and and everything about what you're doing? Sure. So uh, my book, Crash Boom Bang, How to Write Action Movies, is available you know, in Barnes & Noble, if there's any of those left, and um, on Amazon. Right. And my publisher's website, which is w- mwp.com. Uh, um, and um, I teach screenwriting workshops, usually housed at Emory University in Atlanta a few times a year. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's screenwriterschool.com. Uh, and uh, they can follow us um, for tidbits and um, uh, tricks on screenwriting on, on Facebook. Um, and they can email me anytime if they wish at michael at screenwriterschool.com. Be, be careful what you wish for because you might get a couple emails. <laughs> uh, I hope so. Look forward to it. <laughs> michael, thank you so much for coming on, man, and, and, and dropping the knowledge bombs on the, on the tribe today. So thank you again, man. Thank you. Very uh, enjoyed it very much. 